All right, so I have Mike Mutzel here, High Intensity Health, a man that really doesn't need much introduction. Mike, what did you have for breakfast today? Yeah, great question, Thomas. So my breakfast starts around 10, 30, 11, and then I work out around noon. So I had a pound of grass-fed beef with a few olives and ferments, and that's what I found to be you know, uh, low carb, high fat. Um, I like to get the fermented foods in there periodically. I'm a big fan of, and I know you are the health benefits of olives and olive oil. Um, I'm a huge fan of olives. So that's, that's what I ate around, you know, 1045. And then I lifted at noon. So that's generally my, my uh, go-to breakfast. Sometimes I'll throw in some whole fertilized eggs. We have backyard chickens and roosters. Um, so yeah, uh, enough fat, enough protein, just a little bit of carbs and keeps my brain functioning, keeps energy nice and stable. Nice. It sounds very, very similar to what I would have for breakfast too. So I want to jump right into kind of the, uh, for lack of a better term, meat and potatoes, or should I say the bacon and eggs of today's video. Uh, we wanted to address some stuff that's been coming out a lot lately. We've been seeing a lot of people in the sort of low carb keto community doing a little bit of a 180 where they're maybe not being keto full time. They're kind of switching back and forth and kind of alternating. And it's something that's interesting. I had Paul Saladino on the channel not that long ago, and he talked about his big 180 eating now 300, 400 grams of carbs per day. And some of the people in the keto community are just going, what the heck's going on? So I say with air quotes, you know, you and I have both quit full-time keto or quit keto, which raises a lot of eyebrows, but tell me what's going on with you. What are you doing now? Yeah, this is a great question. You know, for me, and this is something that I've always been doing, you know, for a long time been doing, eating more carbs in season when they're seasonally available. So I think that's, you know, I don't have a lot of evidence to support this necessarily from humans, but we know in, in bears and other hibernating animals and animals in general, our metabolisms are not so constant and they fluctuate throughout the year. Our hormones, for example, as men, our, our testosterone levels are highest right now, you know, in July as we record this, you know, early August, and then they'll slowly dip down um, later in the year. So I like to eat what's what is able to be grown within a hundred mile radius of my house. Now I'll make exceptions for avocados. Washington state is not known for avocados, but you know, during the summer I'll have more fruit when it's in season. Uh, in the fall, I'll have more tubers and root vegetables, squashes, uh, things like that. And then, you know, in January, um, February, when there's literally nothing growing here, at least in Washington, that as far as I can see, I'll have more, eat more of a carnivore uh, style approach and have more fatty red meats, do more fasting, things like that. So, you know, again, but I'm able to do this because I exercise. I know we're going to talk about sleep and stress reduction. And I, I do all these other things that give me a little bit more buffer room to afford some of these carbohydrates. So um, that's just what I've uh, found to be helpful. And ideally, most people could achieve, uh, could get to that level where they're able to have blueberries and in-season fruits and vegetables and not have major glycemic issues or health complications as a result of that. So um, obviously, keto is a wonderful tool and it can fast track uh, various aspects of improvements in metabolic health. But do you need to stay in strict nutritional ketosis year round perpetuity? Probably not. So that's just sort of the sort of set of heuristics that I follow. Yeah, that's a very, <clears throat> excuse me, very, very similar to how I would follow it too. And using keto as a tool, I think is, is really the operative phrase there. Um, and I, you know, someone was talking to me uh, and it was a really smart person and they were explaining and they kind of put this amazing analogy and I have to give them credit. His name is Sebastian. And he, he said, you know, you have so much success. Like for me, I was super overweight. Keto got me out of the depths of despair in terms of my health, so to speak. It's easy to want to say, okay, well, this is going to be what I do for the rest of my life because it helped fix the, fix these issues with me. Uh, and this analogy just made so much sense. It's like, if you go, if you get in a car accident and you go to a level three trauma center and that level three trauma center fixes you, you don't stay in the level three trauma center forever, right? You, you know, maybe you bump up to ICU, then you bump up to standard care, and then you maybe go to long-term acute care, whatever, right? But you don't stay in the level three trauma center. And that's not saying that keto is only a level three trauma center, but what happens and what I've noticed is people like keto because it gets them out of these just tremendous metabolic situations. Oh my gosh, this fixed me, it saved me, and there's a probably strong chance it did. It doesn't mean that you need to stay there because once you get yourself there, then you continue to dip your toe in the water with keto as a hormetic stressor to continue to help you out. And I think that's where you and I both are, as well as a lot of people in, in sort of the lower carb community right now. It, I love that analogy. It really makes a whole lot of sense. And I think there's something 
some benefits to periodically having these carbs and actually having some caloric flux. Because, you know, we, I'm sure you talked a lot about this, and we did a video about this about four years ago now, uh, adaptive thermogenesis and how the body really adapts to our calorie restriction and calorie excess and so forth. And this is sort of the problem with uh, continuous energy restriction or AKA dieting is you're never, your body starts to adapt and slow down its overall resting metabolic rate. And so if you don't periodically have refeeds or have uh, enter a state of calorie uh, surplus, then your metabolic rate can start to slow down. And that can lead to catabolism of lean muscle mass, which can make you more insulin resistant and more frail and more likely to die and trip and fall and all these things you want to avoid as you age. So there is some benefits to periodically throwing in carbs. And, and in my opinion, uh, as long as those carbs agree with you, you know, there's some people that if they eat fruit, they ha get bloated, they have SIBO, they have fungus, or all these other things. There's unique variables here that affect people. But I love that analogy of, of using sort of different care based upon uh, where your metabolic health is. And one thing that I, you know, speaking of analogies that I like to work with clients on is referring to sort of metabolic debt. I know you're very financially liter literate and take financial health seriously as everyone should, but some people are in a lot of financial debt. And so they need to take extreme measures to get out of that financial debt. Maybe cutting up all the credit cards, using only cash, you know, being very fastidious about, you know, their spending and, and expenditures and so forth. But once you pay off those credit cards, you pay off those high interest credit cards and loans and things like that, you know, you can maybe start to use a credit card again and you can start to have a little bit more flexibility. So as long as you don't go into more debt, now we can think about that same analogy when it comes to metabolic debt. If you've been insulin resistant, overweight, you haven't exercised, you've been eating high processed, ultra processed uh, carbohydrates and fast food forever, you need to be a little bit more strict initially. Like you said, this is the trauma, you know, trauma center, ICU. But then once you climb out of that, you can, um, you have that more buffer room. So I think there's a lot of ways to sort of look at this, but um, having an honest interpretation of where people's health is with regards to metabolism, and then how to sort of navigate the trajectory um, nutritionally going forward. And we can dive into labs and liver enzymes and triglycerides if, if you want to, to give people more sort of tangible, you know, targets to look at. But um, yeah, I love these analogies because they help people sort of resonate with concepts that they're already familiar with. Totally. It's almost like uh, triaging your nutrition. And that takes being very in tune with your body. And sometimes putting people in a box with say the ketogenic diet is what it takes to get people to fundamentally grasp what their metabolism sort of feels like, for lack of a better term, right? They just, they, they now all of a sudden, oh, this is what it feels like. This is what has been wrong. And, uh, you know, for that, like, I think a lot of us, me personally, you know, I'm indebted to the ketogenic diet for what it did to me. And now it's given me the tools to be able to determine. And you mentioned something, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover with you. But, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, eating seasonally and kind of changing things up. What's interesting is, and I don't really have any scientific literature to back this up. You do a diet for a while or a specific kind of dietary pattern. It works for X amount of time and then suddenly it just kind of stops working, whether it's from weight loss perspective or cognitive or just multiple different things. Oh, I finally discovered the holy grail. This, this is it, this is it, this is it. And then a couple months into it, it's just not working anymore and you switch it up and all of a sudden it works again and you say, ah, oh, this must be the holy grail. I'm going to stick with this. There's something to be said about just periodically switching it up, period. After today's video, you can save 30% off by checking out Thrive Market. They're an online membership-based grocery store. So no matter what kind of dietary pattern you're doing, whether it's vegan, whether it's paleo, whether it's keto, whatever, you can load up on your groceries through Thrive Market, save 30% off your entire grocery order through that link down below, and then it gets delivered to your doorstep. But it's super convenient because you can sort by diet type. So it's like you're shopping specifically for how you eat, your own personalized grocery store. You know? weird kind of way. But that link is down below so you'll save 30% off your initial grocery order plus you get a free $50 gift when you do use the special link since they're a sponsor on this channel. So check them out down below. I really resonate with that and I found that to be very true. And you know, again, I don't know mechanistically why that is. Is it the increased energy? Is it, uh, you know, uh, calorie increases? I'm not sure, but there is and, and you spoke to this, we have to have the courage within us to tinker and test and try different things and not be so regimented. And I think a lot of people, and it's maybe part of our educational system or how schools are, are you know, the, the paradigm through which education is taught. Um, we, we seek approval. Hey, can I go to the bathroom? Hey, hey, is it okay if I leave? And so I think a lot of us are, are sort of 
navigating nutrition with that same set of heuristics. Like, is it okay if I have some blueberries after I just crushed a workout? Of course it's okay. You just depleted glycogen. It, they'll actually benefit you. So having the courage to tinker and try different things and see what works for you. You know, Sally Smith, who is Caucasian, is going to respond different from, you know, Bob, who is of Indian descent, right? So we need to understand that genetics, epigenetics, uh, again, metabolic history, metabolic debt, all these things come into play. And so have the courage within yourself to tinker and test, experiments, use objective biomarkers, glucose testing, things like that to see sort of what's working, what's not, and then adjust accordingly. Now, you're a big circadian guy. You, you know a lot about this. You talk a lot about this. Would you argue, I know we can't say definitively, but in the summertime when we're out in the sun more and we're getting more just overall light exposure, whether it's from vitamin D that we're talking about or literally just, you know, BMAL and PER, the, you know, circadian clock genes and things like that. Would you say that generally speaking, you see people have a better tolerance for carbohydrates during like the summer months? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and I do believe that 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 is the case, uh, particularly because in the summer, we're generally more active. Uh, I see, I mean, just, this is anecdotal, but just in my neighborhood alone, uh, let alone beaches and parks and all that, people are just walking more. They're more physically active. They're taking walks after dinner, you know, in the morning uh, because the days are longer. So people are expending more energy. And I, I do think there is some sort of impact with regards to the seasonality, how it possibly might influence metabolic pathways by way of, you know, light exposure uh, and things like that and possibly other forces that we're unable to quantify or measure. I mean, how do hibernating bears know that it's time to start eating more berries and get ready for hibernation, right? It's not, you know, these are just things that are sort of built into uh, biology that possibly we don't yet know how to quantify or assess. So I, that's my, my perspective. And I do uh, firmly believe that. And you know, this isn't too outlandish. There's various studies that have given people isocaloric identical meals, but have just switched the labels. For example, there was this Michigan State uh, or University of Michigan milkshake, milkshake study where one milkshake was quote unquote indulgent and rich in fats and so forth. And the other milkshake, although the quantities of macronutrients and micronutrients were identical, was labeled as slimming and cutting and diet friendly. And there was a difference in the postprandial response by just the perception that these shakes have different different ingredients. So um, that leads us to believe that, you know, our minds and uh, our vision, uh, light exposure, the intensity of the light might possibly influence our body's metabolism. So um, I do believe that is the case. And so I think if, again, if you're going to experiment with this, uh, having more carbs, tinkering with carbohydrate cycling, possibly the summer months might be a better time to sort of uh, engage in that. That's so interesting because it's almost like, you know, me being a very low carb proponent for the longest time, I sort of demonized fruit in my own mind. And it's kind of funny how that works. And then when I would eat fruit, I would magically have like a bad response to it. And how much of that is psychosomatic, right? How much of that am I sort of manifesting? And it's, I mean, back to Angela Duckworth, I remember she had published this amazing piece talking about the perception of stress directly, right? How you perceive a stressor really dictates how that stressor impacts your body both metabolically, psychologically. It's almost that way, again, anecdotally with nutrition too. It's like if you give yourself permission because you've been exercising to have a few carbohydrates and mind you, for people watching, the carbohydrates we're talking about are not hyperpalatable refined carbohydrates. We're talking about whole food, really good, wholesome sources of carbohydrates. Maybe we just need to be giving ourselves permission. And as we're kind of talking about circadian, I want to move along into another piece that you and I are both super adamant about. You published a video a little while ago about it. I literally just published a video yesterday as of this recording about this, and that is ETRF. And it's a perfect segue because we're talking about circadian cues, we're talking about light, and ETRF is early time restricted feeding. You and I are both huge fans of this. I'm going to let you take the stage and explain ETRF because I think you're even better at explaining it than I am. I don't know about that, but I will say I'm a huge fan of this early time-restricted feeding for a lot of different reasons. And I think part of that, and it speaks to really, it, it dovetails, like you said, exactly into this part of the conversation. Uh, our digestion uh, functions optimally during certain times of the day. And so if, if we just pause that thought and think about what most people have been doing with regards to intermittent fasting for the better part of seven, eight years now, is most people have been fasting all day and bookending their day with a lot of volume of, and a lot of calories, two, 3,000 calories, you know, eating that between, say, 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. Well, 
um, I don't need to tell you. I mean, we know this. Our digestion is not really from a, a, a neurologic intervention standpoint. Our uh, gastrointestinal uh, stomach acid, uh, hydrochloric acid, pan pancreatic lipase, pepsin, bile, uh, all of these uh, different um, motility enzymes and so forth, they are peaking between 11 and about 4. So 11 a.m., 4 p.m. So if you're just having this massive meal right before you go to bed at the end of the day, now I'm sure if you're new to fasting, you're going to be really hungry. There might be a little bit more digestive sort of uh, intervention uh, going on there. But we need to understand that the body is is a, is a, a, a diurnal being, right? Uh, everything is, is, you know, testosterone rises and falls, cortisol rises and falls, and and our digestive tract motility and function uh, tends to be uh, most uh, tends to peak around our gut clock peaks, you know, around eleven to four. Now it might pivot based upon when you go to bed and wait, when you wake up, but it's really the middle part of the day that actually happens to be when leptin is at its lowest level. Now we know that leptin is like this energy sensing hormone, so when it goes low, that's going to signal your brain that you should refeed. So it all all when you look at the hormones of digestion, absorption, of, of satiety, they all suggest that we should be eating earlier in the day and not fasting all day. Uh, and so that's why I'm a, a big fan of the early time restricted feeding aspect. Now, the challenge with this is for some people, once they start feeding, like let's say they have their first meal at 10, 30, 11 or 10, right? Um, for them, it's hard to put um, a, a stop to that. Like it's like, okay, so if you're going to get an 18 or 20 hour fast and you start at 10 and you end at say two or four, how are you going to navigate the rest of your day without food? And so I think that's the hiccup for some people in creating more um, strict habits around that, like, uh, you know, social, ha having earlier dinners with family, uh, making sure that food is hard to access and there's not like chips sitting around your counter and things like that, because that can derail some of this. But um, again, going back to why should we even consider early time restricted feeding compared to intermittent fasting? And it has to do with optimally digesting the food based upon the circadian rhythm influence of digestion and motility, which happens to peak sort of middle of the day. So that's why I'm a fan of it. And what's great about early time restricted feeding, according to several studies that were published you know, in June of 2019 and, and subsequent studies, um, eating just, you don't have to fast as much. So just like a 16-8 uh, early time restricted feeding uh, window was associated with increases in favorable metabolic processes like autophagy, uh, decreases in mTOR, improvements in various uh, enzymes that are linked with uh, more graceful aging and reduced uh, chronic inflammatory responses. So again, I think it's an, an early, it's a thing that we should be considering and it helps to, and I think Thomas, this is the biggest aspect of, of time restricted feeding. It can help support sleep. So we all know that, you know, we can have a poor night's sleep by going out with our friends and staying out late and then hitting up pizza. We've probably all done this in college and we didn't sleep well. We woke up feeling hungover. But when you entrain your peripheral circadian clock system, it helps with the central circadian clock system that's so intimately connected to sleep quality and sleep duration. So when you get your feeding windows in rhythm and you're real consistent with that, you just reinforce the cogs of the circadian clock wheel. And so you just create momentum in this flywheel that's harder to direct derail. And, you know, I, I know that uh, we've all experienced sleep issues in the past, especially peri and postmenopausal women are the group of individuals that tend to suffer most severely, I would say, and, and consistently with sleep issues. So they are the subgroup of, of the population that stands to benefit, in my opinion, the most from early time restricted feeding, again, just because it can help foster a deep and more restful sleep. Yeah. I mean, you nailed just about every single touch point that I've been promoting with it. And this isn't meant to crap on intermittent fasting. Uh, again, intermittent fasting has helped a ton of people. And when you look at the data with intermittent fasting, one of the reasons that I got so into early time restricted feeding wasn't just because the research. I started, candidly, I was getting a little tired of consistently defending 16-8 and defending uh, standard intermittent fasting against a lot of people that were very anti-intermittent fasting. And when I started looking at the data, I'm saying, yes, okay, Gaps between meals and longer fasting periods certainly seem to have some positive impact on insulin resistance and whatnot. But when you really do put them side by side, at the end of the day, a lot of the benefits from 16-8 at least, not longer fast, but 16-8, were just coming from basic caloric restriction. And I know it pisses people off to hear that because it's unfortunate because we, we really do preach a lot of this intermittent fasting benefit as gospel. But I have to say that when you do look at the longer periods of time that people are doing 16-8, again, 
full disclaimer, I'm not talking about longer fast. I'm not talking about 20 hours, 22 hours, 24 hours. I'm talking about the standard 16, eight where people skip breakfast, huge benefits. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I've been promoting this for years. I, it worked for me. So I, I can't disclaim that enough, but a lot of times what ends up happening is people are just putting themselves into a caloric deficit and for a period, and then eventually they get themselves into a metabolic slowdown. And it just, they, they've just been skipping breakfast every single day for the last two years. And then they realize, oh shoot, this isn't working anymore. Well, yeah, because what you did was absolutely good. You were reducing calories, which was still activating AMPK. It was still doing the things that we really want to do, still triggering that autophagic flux, all the things we want. But the thing I like about ETRF is it flips a lot of the whole calories in, calories out equation on its head. And it's less about that discussion. That discussion always matters. Don't get me wrong. The thermodynamics discussion is always relevant, but ETRF it's just different because you're talking about circadian cues and you're sort of manipulating that a little bit more. So the benefits sort of override what people try to shoot down with intermittent fasting all the time. And that's why I'm trying to convince people that just give it a shot. Try a couple days a week of having either a very small dinner or just three days a week, just skip dinner. Just try it. And you know you will notice within the first couple times you do it how much better your sleep is. And when I'm wearing a continuous glucose monitor, like I notice my glucose area under the curve is significantly better. And there's a BMC medical genomic study. That's one of my favorite studies to reference. I think I even referenced it in the Paul Saladino interview. You start the day with insulin sensitive muscles and insulin resistant fat cells. And that flips on its head as the day goes on. So your fat cells become more insulin sensitive later in the day, which means your fat cells are more likely to suck up nutrients and go through a hypertrophic state in the evening than they would be in the morning. What I'm saying here is enjoy a big breakfast, have your social breakfasts and try to flip everything on its head. It's amazing. And this actually works really well for parents. I know you have young, young children as I do. Kids are generally, they get hungry for breakfast, right? It's not reasonable to tell your kid, no, we're fasting, honey. Just, just wait till lunch. Like kids wake up pretty hungry uh, and they're fine oftentimes skipping dinner. And that's the thing. And so when you start to sort of bookend your day with food and then cut off earlier, you're, you're not so hungry because you've already had calories and energy and you hit it just brilliant about how uh, our glycemic control worsens throughout the day. Um, and so that's, that's not really a good thing, a, a good time to start eating. Uh, and then there's another just sort of related conversation that I think uh, people should be aware of. In, in late 2020, there was a study that randomized women to consume 600 calories, either with extra calories with dinner or a cal 600 calories of snacks after dinner between the window when they stopped eating between eight and 11. And again, so energy is controlled in this situation. They, they prescribed, you know, meals for these people and just said, Hey, eat this with your dinner or after dinner. And the group that ate the 600 calorie uh, snack after dinner tended to put on more visceral fat compared to the women that just ate those calories with dinner. So there's something to be said with, we've talked a lot about sleep, but obviously people don't want to lose weight and, and figure out you know, novel solutions to prevent age-related weight gain. And so just having those calories earlier, uh, whether it's you know what the mechanisms are, whether it's like the fat cell sensitivity like we're referring to, or the, uh, the, the, the insulin resistance that occurs as a consequence of, of the day going on, or it's perturbations in sleep. It, we don't really know all the details here, but the point is the closer that you eat towards dinner, the more likely you're going to store fat and have a poor night's sleep. Two things that most people want to avoid. So uh, the, the situation that we're proposing here is just eat earlier in the day and start your fast earlier in the day. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a win-win. It, it's nice. Go for a walk. Uh, you can do more productive things if you don't have to worry about cooking a big dinner and doing these things. You can read, you can go paddleboarding, you can go on a hike, you can do a lot of great things. So yeah, it's a good way of putting, putting it. And it's so interesting you mentioned, you know, kind of how insulin resistance sort of increases throughout the course of the day. And people look at insulin resistance and they think this is automatically the worst thing possible. It's a disease state. Yes, but also it's nutrient sensing in your body. Your body is becoming insulin resistant to a certain degree because its fuel demands are somewhat met. So even if you ate breakfast in the morning, and you became more insulin resistant throughout the course of the day, most of us become more insulin resistant throughout the course of the day because we're inactive, the fuel is accumulating with less activity. So it's actually in a weird wraparound way, almost a survival system for the cell to say, I don't need more fuel, man, I'm gonna neglect it. Now we have psychological situations that are probably impeding us from getting those signals properly. And that's probably a completely different discussion that has to do with dopamine and phones and all kinds of stuff where those systems are just dysregulated. But I'll end on this part before we move into the next piece. 
We all got into intermittent fasting because we were looking at things from a different approach. We wanted to flip the paradigm on its head. We wanted to try something different. Things change. Science evolves. Science grows. Now we're asking you to stretch your mental muscles a little bit and try something new. Try something different that's going to seem difficult. But with things that are difficult, a lot of times come really cool results. So give it a shot. But okay, now I want to move into something that you and I have eerily been simultaneously interested in, and that is the world of exerkines, exerkines, potato, potato. Uh, we both, <laughs> interestingly enough, had looked at the exact same paper. I filmed a video on this last week. It doesn't air for a couple of months, but uh, so it's probably going to come out on Mike's channel sooner. So if you haven't already subscribed to his channel, but Mike, what is an exerkine? Yeah. I mean, so these are hormones or molecules that are released from muscle upon stimulation by way of exercise. So um, the way that I've been reframing it, and I would love to bounce, you know, it's, sometimes it's good, you know, when you're learning a new sort of set of heuristics to, to hear from other people, their perspective. So I'd love to know your perspective, Thomas. But, you know, when we think about muscle, a lot of people just think like, oh, this is this organ that's aesthetic. It's it's something that you just have to, to look better in front of a, a, a mirror or on the beach. But it's actually an organ that is actively secreting hormones, much in the same way that your thyroid or your adrenals or your pancreas is or are. And so but we need to think about how those um, this organ of muscle, it's actually by weight, the largest organ in the body, skeletal muscle is an organ. It's very metabolically active and, and endocrinologically active. And so the way that it releases hormones is a little bit different from say the thyroid. The thyroid gets messages from the brain, you know, TSH and so forth to make uh, thyroxine and triiodothyronine and all this. But the, the muscles, how they get the stimulation to actually release these so-called exerkines or hormones or myokines is by movement. And so we need to constantly move our muscle to tell it to release these hormones, apolin, arisin, there's all these different hormones that communicate with the brain, with our bone and, and improve bone mineral density, that communicate with our heart and our cardiovascular system. And they also, um, these myokines or exerkines communicate with other key metabolic organs that we've talked about today, and that is the fat cells and the liver. And so when we move by walking, by gardening, by hiking, by lifting weights, by doing yoga, when we're moving the muscles, we're putting a, an adaptive stress, a hormetic stress on that muscle these molecules start moving uh, around and they're communicating with the liver. Hey, liver, we need more glycogen. We need more glucose. Hey, fat cells, you know, all that stored energy in there. Come on, we need some of that over here in our legs because we're hiking, right? So this crosstalk is mediated by these extra kinds. And so I think it's very important for people to realize because we all have days where it's like, oh, I'm too tired to go to the gym. Like it's been a long day. My kid's been yelling at me. Work's been stressful. I'm just going to like crush some Netflix and drink some whiskey. Well, we need to understand that this organ muscle hasn't been stimulated if you've been stressed out working and you haven't yet gone for a walk, done some yoga, done some weightlifting, some push-ups or air squats. Just that small amount of stimulation by moving the muscles cause these extra kinds to be released, which I think it's so fascinating because this time last year, there was a study that showed, and I think it was uh, at University of California, Berkeley or, or UCLA, what they found is that moving skeletal muscle causes these extracellular vesicles to be released. And within those vesicles were microRNA. MicroRNA tells epigenetically cells to start making proteins. And so these extracellular vesicles are yet another way that's, that movement within skeletal muscle is able to uh, cause adaptations throughout the body. And what's even more fascinating is a study that just came out in May of this year found that movement in skeletal muscle in humans, this is not animals, was able to cause favorable remodeling of the heart that is uh, th this remodeling and sort of damage can occur, fibrosis and so forth, in the heart in, when people have uh, hypertension or high blood pressure. And there's this extracellular vesicle that's been shown to be released by skeletal muscle that goes into the heart specifically and remodels the heart to reverse some of the damage caused by hypertension. And so we're learning so much more here about the crosstalk of this. And I just love this because this is not necessarily a pill that you can go out and take. A lot of people uh, operate on this mindset. Well, my cholesterol is high. My doctor said I can take this drug. And then therefore I continue to consume the same foods that cause the problem. But now we're saying, hey, look, I know you don't like to exercise, but just give it 10 or 15 minutes because it's going to release this, this plethora of favorable signaling molecules that affect all organ systems. Again, brain, heart, immune system, cardiovascular, bone, I mean, fat cells. It's, it's just amazing. So 
I just get excited about it. Um, I, you know, I know you like the biochemistry like I do, but also I think this information, once people know that it's not just about burning calories, it's about just some sort of stimulus to the muscle, which can be walking up a hill. It doesn't have to be much. That's going to cause this release of favorable changes. And maybe in 10, 20 years, we'll have wearables or trackables that can quantify irisin and apolin and all these different molecules that scientists are unearthing with regards to exercise. Um, but right now, all we know is that, hey, the muscle is an organ. In order to stimulate this organ, you have to be active and try to be active every day. Yeah, that's beautifully said. And there was a study in cell metabolism that looked a little bit more at uh, exerkines as far as uh, what would happen with them, even with glucose metabolism versus ketone metabolism, which was pretty interesting. Um, and exerkines and circadian cues go hand in hand too. So what's interesting is what Mike's describing. I want you to think of it as a, uh, I'm just going to call it a shadow or an umbrella, right? Or just think of the effect that the, uh, the muscles have as, actually, let's call it a light because a shadow has a negative connotation. Okay. When you exercise, you're essentially, you're shining a light on your body, right? It, well, the time that you shine that light is going to have different impacts on different tissues and different cells and organs. So those uh, excuse me, myokines and exokines in the morning are going to cast their light over a completely different set of things than what they might cast their light over in the evening. This is where things get interesting. So if you think of exercise as a literal pill for a second, Sometimes your doctor will give you a medication. He'll say, hey, it's very important you take this in the morning. It's very important you take this in the afternoon or very important you take this with a meal or in the evening. Sometimes it's a digestive situation. Sometimes it truly is so that it actually interacts with things better. Those drug interactions are what they're setting out to do. If you think of exercise as a supplement and stop thinking of it as a means to burn calories, you can actually tailor it and say, I'm going to exercise at different times of the day to cast different benefits on different organs. And it's really interesting because it's just that. They saw uh, that there was more of a benefit for people that were on a lower carb protocol producing ketones to actually exercise in the first half of the day uh, compared to carbohydrates where it might have been a little bit better in the afternoon as far as the exercines are concerned. And that probably just has to do with fuel availability. Uh, that being said, uh, it doesn't mean that exercising in the morning if you're a carb-fed athlete or a carb-fed person is bad. In fact, you can actually argue that there's some solid benefits there too. But as far as the exocrines are speaking, just the effect they have on various tissues and sort of metabolic regulation, it's just super interesting. And it's, yeah, just thinking of it as a pill, as a supplement, changes how you look at it. That's a beautiful way to reframe it. Um, because again, the, the thing about that's different about fitness is it's you have to participate in this. Um, you know, if you think of like taking collagen or bone broth or eating low carb, right? Relatively passive. You just have to learn how to cook differently and then you consume that. But this is a little bit more proactive, sort of like reading, uh, you know, these different things. And, and, but if you think about it in terms of knowing the benefits and understanding that it's just not about burning calories, that you need to add that stimulus, I think it really helps reframe this for people and makes them more consistent to make, make, make them make it more of a consistent habit, which I think is something also that the research is boring out is there's this acute increase in these exerkines or myokines, but then there's this chronicity and, and we hear about chronic, oh, whoa, 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 that's bad. No, chronic exercisers, people who are habitually regular exercisers tend to have an even more pronounced post-exercise uh, release of these different exerkines. And so this is something, again, we need to be uh, more consistent about and with is is movement and uh, to dovetail into what you were saying um, our body starts to anticipate exercise so um, what i suggest to clients because you can split hairs should you do fasted cardio in the morning or should you have some you know some uh, coffee with uh, collagen or whatever what about training in the afternoon you're in a less catabolic state um, what i generally recommend to people is just when you can consistently exercise make that the time that you do it because you're more likely to make it a habit right so if it's first thing in the morning for you because your kids are still asleep just do that start doing that every day and your body will adapt and you'll get better and better at, at, at doing it um, when we're whimsical with this and we sort of fit it in when we can it's hard to make it a consistent habit and we generally then if it's not consistent we're not 
going to stick with it. And I think that's the important thing that um, the research is, is starting to suggest is it's the consistency, the habitual exercise and movement is associated with most of the benefits. So for me, it's middle part of the day. It breaks up the day. I'm a little bit, my body temperature is warmed up. I generally like to do a cold plunge in the morning. The sun's out, um, all these different things. And I have my first meal around 10, 30, 11. And then by then I've digested some food and actually have a better workout um, as a result of that. So again, it's just, Think about the consistency and when you're most likely going to make it a routine habit in terms of uh, getting the most bang for your buck. Yeah, that's good conversation here because it's interesting how I, I used to roll out of bed and pretty much immediately work out. And I was finding that just as you mentioned, the body anticipates exercise. I was starting to wake up earlier and earlier and earlier each morning because my body was almost anticipating this fight or flight response that was about to come. And I started realizing, oh shoot, like, this whole like rolling out of bed and training first thing in the morning for me was actually starting to become a problem. It wasn't working as well. So now I work out about an hour and a half to two hours after I wake up and I find that, yeah, my body temperature is a little bit better. I find my risk of injury seems to be a little bit less. Uh, it's pretty interesting. And what you mentioned is so solid because 90% of the adherence is happening up here. So if you can just accomplish that, then you're great. When people want to start testing different times of day to work out, they also have to understand that it's going to come at a cost. It's more difficult. And one of the reason I say it's more difficult is because your body has anticipated that. And it's, you're, you're just not anticipating you working out in the afternoon. So what I like to do, and this has been helpful for some people that I've mentioned it to, I have my standard workout, which is still early morning. But then I also like to dip my toe in the water and work out occasionally doing a two a day and work out in a very fed state towards the end of the day. It's interesting, I find it more difficult because it's not what I'm wired for generally. But people talk about, okay, well, I wanna be metabolically flexible. I wanna be able to be dual fueled. And if people are very low carb all the time and they always train fasted, there is some evidence that you can become a little bit more glucose intolerant. Now that doesn't mean diabetic. That means that your cells might not suck up the glucose for fuel as quickly as they would if you were conditioned to training in a fed state. You ever notice how interesting it is how evenly split it is with people that want to fight about training fasted versus not training fasted. I perform better or I perform better or my way is better. Well, maybe it's just how you've been training for all this time and you've adapted an efficiency to that. So I encourage people to try to develop an efficiency to both. So occasionally I'll actually have a little bit of honey and then I'll go work out because I actually want to force that glucose and encourage my body to develop the transporters for that so that I am ruthlessly fit throughout different mediums versus a one trick pony. Mm, I love that. And I frequently do that too, um, with regards to the cardio or some hit training is break it up. I mean, first of all, I don't like to work out for 90 minutes. I feel like I'm like, gosh, I could be doing so many different things. So what I'll do generally is like 45, 60 minutes weight training. And then later in the day, we'll go for a hike, a bike ride, or I'll do some explosive interval type work with a medicine ball or on uh, the Carol bike or things like that, a rower, ski erg. But yeah, it's usually in the fed state, like you said. And, and sometimes I produce, I like to use wattage as when I'm doing intervals to look at the power, how much, you know, what, what, how much intensity, how much effort am I putting into this particular movement? Uh, and I generally have my peak power later in the day, right? And, and so, yeah, it's, it's splitting it up, you know, it's a nice way to do it, especially if time uh, constraints are a factor. But um, I, I like that approaching it with this dual, dual fuel perspective and, and making sure that your body is still uh, adequately uh, able to incorporate glucose and, and glycolysis and so forth, um, as well as burning some of those fats and ketones and utilizing that. So that's a great perspective. Yeah. Yeah, man. You see it when you're wearing a CGM and you've been, uh, you know, deep keto for 45 days or something and you go and do a hard workout, you get this outrageous spike that is a glucose spike that is higher than it would be if you were maybe a little more glucose tolerant. Uh, and that's purely anecdotal, right? I mean, there is some evidence, there is evidence with the glucose tolerance situation and, and longer term keto and things like that. But it's, uh, again, I say glucose intolerance doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It's just what you have the little shuttle transporters available, you know, to be able to move those fuels in and out. And that's a simple way of putting it. Um, with that, you know, with training in the morning, training fasted versus training in the afternoon. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a very casual kind of lame way to put it, but you have to do what just feels best for you, period. Because uh, I think the emotional response is ultimately what's going to bring you back to doing it again. Totally. Yeah. And then forming community around it too, or making sure it's a consistent habit with some friends. If, 
you are able to work out with friends. And so what I've been in now that gyms are reopened and you don't have to wear a mask and so forth in Washington, I've been going to the gym in the afternoon sometimes too, because it's nice because I see people I know, I get to talk and, and that is going to reinforce the habit. Now I'm not talking the whole time, but just if you're having, uh, basically the point of me bringing this up is if people are having a hard time making this a consistent routine, create some social connections, make the private public, take a selfie, put it on Instagram, put it on Facebook, do something to reinforce that habit because the the progress is what begets more progress. There's nothing uh, more disappointing uh, than, and I know you've had injuries and so we've all been there. When you go to the gym and the workout sucks and you're not getting progress, you're not likely to continue to, to exercise because you're not progressing. Like if you picked up a book and started reading and then the next day you didn't remember what you read, you would stop reading. You'd be like, this is dumb. I don't like this. I'm not learning. And so the exercise is the same way. And so that's what I've been doing too, is doing more group classes periodically, uh, getting my daughter involved. And then, so, so then we're both committed. It's like, hey, Saturday mornings, we're going at 930 to this class and she likes it. I like it. That way, you know, if I decide or think on Friday night, you know, I, I think I should open up a bottle of wine. I'm like, then wait a minute, I have a workout tomorrow morning. So then, you know, it's these habits start to reinforce one another. And then it makes, you know, you start to lose the weight, you start to look lean, and then it becomes your identity. And I think that's a big part of um, where people are struggling with this is, um, you know, how to how to make consistent habits, you know, with and, and identify as a healthy person instead of the overweight diabetic type person. So that's, anyway. yeah, you posted something on Instagram, <clears throat> excuse me, that was that was great, just about that, about identifying with your, your condition. And you can identify with positive things too. And, you know, yeah, it's, I got out of the habit of going to a, a public gym during, you know, pandemic times and realized occasionally going back to it, how just tremendously entertaining it is. Some of the best people watching in the world you're going to find in the gym. And that, that counts for something, you know, call me crass for saying that, but it's, you know, entertainment and just, just stimulus, mental stimulus. This, if there's anything that I've learned over the last six, eight months is how important just that mental stimulus is not just the physical. Cause I was always kind of the guy, the lone wolf guy. I'd go in the gym super early. I'd train at home and I realized that that doesn't necessarily build adherence that just builds uh, sort of this self preserving addiction to the gym. It's not really like really building a true habit. So it's pretty interesting to, to kind of look at that. So yeah, have some fun with it for sure. Totally. And then, okay, I want to segue into something that's quite a bit different, but it's an interesting discussion that has been coming up more and more, especially since I did a video talking about it. Um, and that is surrounding the world of what is called lipotoxicity, where anytime we're in a state of being overfed, whether it's carbs, whether it's fat, like tremendously overfed. I don't want to say just being a slight surplus, but overfeeding in general is not good, right? And I think what we come down to the situation of hyperpalatability with these foods, the reason that we probably have an obesity situation is because we are stimulating parts of the brain that aren't naturally designed to be stimulated and it's triggering us to eat more and more and more. The reason that this comes up, and I'm just curious to hear your take on it because I don't have a firm stance one way or the other. I'm just learning about it. Uh, you know, the amount of super high fats and actually lipotoxicity, if you don't occasionally bring those fats down and keep them in check and how that can affect insulin resistance, how it can affect uh, atherosclerosis, these things that sometimes at the low carb community, we like to just casually ignore or push away because we think all fat is good. But to a certain extent, I mean, if you're eating 10,000 calories of saturated fat, that's going to be a problem. Uh, but maybe that's just me. I'm just curious your take on it. And you can totally rebut me on this. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm learning through this. Yeah, no, this is, a, I think, a great point. Um, and that is this notion that uh, at the cellular level, you know, excessive lipid signaling can uh, decrease insulin sensitivity, can cause lipotoxicity, uh, and can actually damage uh, essential organs like the pancreas or even the muscle tissue and uh, fat cells and things like that. And so I, on the cellular level, I don't know, I haven't dove into this too much to know what is the cellular difference between getting uh, a lot of saturated fats versus the so-called lipotoxicity that would be linked with insulin resistance, prediabetes, and fatty liver disease? But the best, uh, the best way that I can think about this is I, I think there is a molecular difference here because of the, the classic sort of lipotoxicity that would be created as a result of eating a standard American diet and 
hyper palatable processed junk food and things like that. Um, those lipids are also uh, being synthesized, synthesized not just from the diet, but from de novo lipogenesis as a consequence of insulin resistance in the liver. And so that can be part of that. There's different chain lengths of these short chain, medium chain fats and, and so forth. And those, to the best of my knowledge, are a little bit more problematic. And then there's changes within uh, the cell metabolites, malonyl CoA, and these different metabolites that actually create insulin resistance within the cell. So it's, it's sort of like a, a double whammy with the uh, hyper with the with the standard American diet induced increase in uh, de novo lipogenesis and this lipotoxicity. But to your point, I mean, if you want to um, create insulin resistance, and uh, well, let's just. I'll just share a small little side story about uh, lipotoxicity and, and this lipid load test, something that's emerging from the cardiovascular research. We all know about the glucose tolerance test. This is given to people, uh, doctors prescribe an 80 gram dextrose solution to people, sometimes actually pregnant uh, women to see if they have gestational diabetes or prediabetes to people who are insulin resistant. Well, there's this new uh, trend that's been emerging actually and percolating in the research since 2011 known as the uh, lipid load test. So instead of giving people a bolus dose of glucose, giving them a bolus dose of fat and, um, and then looking at the post post meal rise in triglycerides. And so um, basically, just like with glucose, you don't want your triglycerides to go through the roof. You want to keep them under 220 milligrams per DL. And so I was doing a lot of fatty coffee. And so I'm getting to the story here. So I was like, all right, I've been doing this bulletproof coffee thing for a long time. And you know, I've been reading about this lipid load test and non-fasted blood work. So I'm like, okay, so what's going to happen to my blood triglycerides, which uh, I'm sure yours are the same way, Thomas. You know, they hover around 60, 70, something like that, milligrams per deal. So I go and do a Bulletproof coffee, go to the same uh, lab corp that I've been going to for years, and my triglycerides were 240 or 230, something like that, and I was blown away uh, because that was a massive, they, they increased more than 3X. And generally, in, the, in a non-fasted or post-meal level, you do not want your triglycerides to go above 220. So I was like, okay, well, there's something to be said about how the fat is being delivered. So if you have saturated fat from whole food, you have ground beef, you have a ribeye, you have maybe avocado, other, other for, you know, foods that have saturated fat versus liquid saturated fat, liquid butter. These are actually different because the rate at which they're absorbed. And so the liquid fats are increased via the chylomicrons, go in through the hepatic circulation, and they're in the bloodstream very quickly. So I think there is something to be said about not only the quantity of fats, but what is the source of that, i.e. liquid, processed, sort of, or in a whole real food, and sort of consider that. And then for people listening, you know, trying to figure out, hey, could I be having this lipotoxicity from my relatively fat-rich diet? Well, the only way to really know that is to do a lipid load test on yourself. And so I encourage clients to have a standard meal that they would normally have. You know, I described earlier, I have a pound of, of grass-fed meat, sometimes with some egg yolks and, and olives. So that would be like a, about 60, 70 grams of fat. So I could go and run my labs. I haven't yet done this on that particular meal, but maybe I will in the future. Uh, and just to see what is, the, what is the delta between my fasting triglycerides and my post-meal triglycerides. And that would give people a, a more personalized understanding about potentially this lipotoxicity that you're referring to. And what's encouraging from the medical side is most doctors are now on board with this. For years, it was always recommended before you do any sort of labs, you want to be fasted. But now that the, the sort of the, the set of heuristics is changing such that people are recommending patients actually do non-fasted labs, which again would help us better understand is the quantity of fat that Sally Smith or Joe listening right now eating in that meal is that too much for their metabolic reserves or capacity at this point in time? So I don't know if that helps to resonate, you know, sort of with this reconcile with what we're talking about here. But to me, I think that's a great way to sort of reframe how to think about, um, you know, fat quantity and to figure out uh, to be more prescriptive is to use labs as a gauge. No, that is tremendous. And actually it kind of blows my mind a little bit because it's such a simple thing, right? Like we, and, and you mentioned something early on in that statement about, processed foods, hyper palatable foods. And it's so interesting because when you put people that are focused on a lower carb protocol, they might look at a bag of Doritos and say, oh my gosh, there's, you know, 27 grams of carbs in a serving. But they also forget to look at the fact that there's also in conjunction with that 19 grams of fat right alongside those carbohydrates, right? So 
it makes it difficult to determine what is actually the problem. And in tandem, I think is the problem, right? I think it's the overfeeding. Some people disagree with this. And I, again, I don't have a firm stance on it, but I'm finding it interesting that, you know, you start looking at like the, uh, you know, the J and K pathway and some of these things that are activated based as an inflammatory response based upon nutrient sensing. And the in vitro research that's coming out is what's got me a little bit thrown aloof, right? The, some of the in vitro research is demonstrating that pancreatic beta cells Basically, the fuel density is dictating what the pancreatic beta cell does. And when there's fat, which is extremely fuel dense, that pancreatic beta cell essentially has enough ATP that it does not feel necessary to get stimulated by glucose because it's already adequately fueled. That is what's interesting. Now, that is in vitro. A lot changes, obviously, but it's super interesting mechanistically because it comes right back to a, just a theory that I've had for years that a lot of our nutrition, a lot of our problems come right back to feedback loops and, and nutrient sensing and our body just being one step ahead of where we could ever possibly be in terms of knowing where we are metabolically, how much fuel is on hand, how much fuel is not on hand. So for me to say you shouldn't have more than 100 grams of saturated fat is entirely wrong. But at the same time, it might be entirely right for Carol that needs that that can't do it, right? For whatever reason, many hundreds of reasons that could be brought up. So it's just very interesting, and I brought this up in video, possibly a little bit too concretely because I was so excited about the research, because I have personally noticed that that's the first lever that I pull from a body composition standpoint. Like if I'm doing a lower carb protocol, the easiest lever for me to pull to get leaner is to actually just start cranking down the fats a tiny bit and keep my protein high. If anything, increase my protein and decrease the fats. And even when I say that from a very nonchalant way in terms of, hey, it's an easy lever to pull because nine calories per gram, like volume of food, if you start decreasing the fats, you're, you're probably going to put yourself in a deficit and you're already in a ketogenic state. You'll probably start to suck up pretty quick. Um, but it automatically sets this tone that fats are being demonized and the whole world with saturated fats. It's like exactly like you mentioned, even with a saturated fat that's been liquefied, it's changing how it's transported. Even though the carbon chain length is, is still long, just how it hops on board the clamicron and actually does where it's supposed to go. Point is, it's very interesting, and I just I wanted to hear your opinion on it because it's just wild, especially uh, when you start looking at how the pancreas actually responds to fat, not just carbohydrates. It's just it's mind blowing to me, at least. That's amazing. Yeah, I'll have to dive into that study that you referenced. That's really cool. Um, I did not know that, but yeah, it's it's really incredible. Um, and and I find as humans, you know, we can be a little bit logically inconsistent, and there's sort of this false dichotomy. Um, or if, if you if you say, well, maybe people are having too much fat, then then therefore you must be saying that all fats are bad, which is not the case. Context really matters. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's important, but I'm with you too. Um, to get leaner, uh, for me, it's, it's cutting out, you know, the carbs first generally, and then scaling back on the fats and like you said, increasing the protein. And, and that really seems to have sort of a, a nice cutting type effect. Um, but yeah, um, but if you say that, people think, well, you're saying fats are bad. It's like, no, 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 not saying fats are bad. It's just the context in which we're talking about needs to be considered. Um, yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting because I talked to someone like Paul Saladino. Obviously, he has a very, very adverse opinion to that. Like it's very polar opposite. But his situation is also different. I do think that on a ketogenic diet, <laughs> This is, I gotta be careful saying this because I don't wanna give people a license to just go overboard. I do think you're granted a fair bit more amnesty in terms of how much fat you have. But for the average person that's also consuming processed carbohydrates and refined starches, I do think at that point, additional fats might cause a problem. For someone to be eating, I don't even wanna call it the standard American diet. Let's call it partially standard American diet. Maybe they're eating 300 grams of carbs per day and they're doing it with decent carbs, maybe not perfect carbs. But then they're also eating fats that are the kinds of fats and the amounts of fats they would eat on a ketogenic diet. That is nutrient overload. And at that point, what's causing the problem? Are the carbs causing the problem or are the fats causing the problem? What is actually doing more damage? And that could be very independent and personal. It's a great point. And speaking of personal, if we just want to talk about Paul Saladino for a minute, you know, he used to live in Washington state and, and when he lived here, he and I hung out, we went wakeboarding, wake surfing, all that. Um, I mean, he was eating a lot of organs, a lot of muscle meat, flesh, all that. Um, but he lives near the equator now. And so for, we got to consider sort of the seasonality and, you know, I, I mean, I know you've been to Hawaii and Kauai and these different islands and 
Mexico, Costa Rica. I mean, when you're down there, um, imagine eating a zero carb diet. Imagine saying, no, I'm not going to have any mangoes, papayas, none of that. I'm just going to eat meat or just liver. It's like that would get very boring very quickly. Uh, it's very hot there. You're dehydrated, um, you know, maybe getting some electrolytes, potassium from these fruits. And so I think, I think it's also helpful to consider the context under which someone is thriving eating a, a diet like that. And it's not to say that if you live in Minnesota, you can't benefit from honey or fruit. I'm not saying that, but we also need to consider um, the context there. And so I know, you know, when I travel, we, I was just in Hawaii in March. I mean, we're crushing fruit uh, and coconuts and and all that, right? Because it's it's right growing like within a 20 mile radius of where where I was staying. So um, I think that is an important consideration when people are saying, well, hey, this guy does it. Well, you got to consider where where are they living? What are they doing? They're surfing hours a day, you know, we also, all those things need to come into uh, consideration. So I just wanted to kind of, I've been thinking about that, but haven't actually said that on a video. So I wanted to mention it and see what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's, I would agree. I would agree. And I think that sometimes it comes back to this age old discussion of maybe we're a little too dogmatic in our way of thinking with people's nutrition, you know, and people have a lot to say about Paul and he's an agitator online. That's kind of his persona, right? So he's, he's, he's there to get a rise out of people. So uh, the more that you get upset with Paul to get upset with Paul, you're just going to make Paul's day because that's what he wants. And that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just Paul. And people really, really have been razzing him because he's done a little bit of a 180 in his intake on carbs. And who cares? Like he, he's, I, he's doing what works for him and he's sharing knowledge that people are gaining from and he's exciting people about something. And in a lot of ways, I think he's actually shut the mouths of a lot of people that were so hard on him in the past for being so anti-carb. He's actually come around and people are people that didn't like him before are liking him more now. So I definitely think where you live matters. And it's weird. You know, I live up in Tahoe a lot of the time. And when I'm up at altitude, I've been trying to reverse engineer what's going on and why when I'm at altitude, I seem to like, I thrive really well in a lower carb state and it probably has to do with uh, ketones do have a regulatory effect on sort of augmenting CO2 in the brain and kind of how we our desire to breathe, our need to breathe. But I find once I'm actually acclimated, I perform worse on a ketogenic diet at altitude and actually need a little bit of carbs but as far as the acclimation so it's just interesting there's all kinds of different things but the other piece of the equation is i'm at high altitude and maybe the effect from the sun is significantly more impactful on me at 7,000 feet and that's actually driving a desire to eat more carbohydrate it's just who knows right it's not right or wrong i don't know i just based on how i feel and kind of keep track of it but it's weird that is it's super interesting. Well, you crushed it on that hike we did around this time last year, fasted. So that, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that was awesome. That was fun, man. We got to do that again. But yeah. Well, I want to wrap it up because we've been rocking for quite a while. But first of all, um, where can people find you? Your electrolytes are awesome. I know I talk about you know Element a lot on this channel, but I'm not opposed to talking about things that I think work. Your electrolytes, if you're looking for something that's more magnesium focused, I definitely will say that Mike has some awesome, I'll give you, you know, tell people where they can find you, but also just give a little blurb on, you know, on your company and how people can support you as well. Sure. Well, really appreciate the opportunity, Thomas. And it was fun to chat back and forth. And and for the record, I'm not trashing Paul at all. I was just saying, you know, just encouraging people to consider the context and stuff like that. I think he's a great guy, uh, excellent surfer and wake surfer. So um, my, my platform, uh, primarily YouTube and, and iTunes base, it's called High Intensity Health. Um, so if people want to you know connect and uh, check out some videos, that'd be awesome. And um, yeah, I, I have a background in the nutritional manufacturing space. Uh, that's how I got into health in 2006. And so I, uh, in the last year, created this electrolyte sticks that features um, real salt, real Redmond salt, uh, creatine and taurine. Uh, based upon research, you know, there's a lot of people think of creatine as this thing that you take, it turns you into a bodybuilder. It's actually involved in cellular hydration and studies have shown that when you pair the electrolytes with the creatine, there tends to be a better response. So uh, a lot of people have found benefit with that. You don't have to, you don't have to load it like uh, classic creatines and things uh, of that sort, but it has a nice pre-workout, intra-workout effect. And um, that's uh, it's through the, the company called MyoScience. And so, um, yeah, folks are interested. There's plenty of reviews. People can, you know, see if it's a, a good fit for them or not uh, at my own science. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's where people can find me. So if, if you enjoy this content, uh, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Perfect. And I'll, I'll link out to all Mike's channels down below in the description as well as uh, my own science too. So everyone can can find what he's talking about and what he's working on, which, you know, for someone that's focused on the science, I can't say with enough clout, that's exactly the kind of product you want to be looking for. People that are obsessed with the research and people that really are putting 
it sounds so cheesy to say now, putting the science first. But anyhow, uh, so make sure you go check out Mike. And as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. And I'll see you tomorrow.